Hi everyone here and around the world. Good news. Our Earth Files YouTube channel has broken through 221,000 subscribers. We're halfway to 222,000. Thank you everyone. If you haven't subscribed, it doesn't cost you anything, but it helps Earth Files at YouTube. So I appreciate your clicking on the red button in the lower right of your screen if you haven't subscribed. And this week, the Live Science website reported that, quote, scientists are working on an official alien contact protocol for when ET phones Earth, close quote. What would the first words from Earth humanity be to non-humans making contact with us from someplace else in this universe? The answer to that contact question is now being created at the Scotland University of St. Andrews, founded in 1413 and ranks among English-speaking countries as the oldest university on Earth. Heading the new 2023 Alien Contact Protocol Project is computer scientist John Elliott, a professor of computer science at St. Andrews. Until now, the only other alien contact protocol that humans have had was produced three decades ago by the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, shown here, also known as SETI. Back then, searching for ETs included verifying signals as possible contact and then reporting to the public or scientists and Secretary General of the United Nations. Now, at the end of 2022, headed into 2023, it is rumored by Pentagon insiders to be finally the year, 2023, that truth comes to this planet, that we're not alone in this big cosmos and a new space era will begin. This week, Professor Elliott at St. Andrews issued this statement, quote, Science fiction is awash with explorations of the impact on human society following discovery of and even encounters with life or intelligence elsewhere. Will we ever get a message from E.T.? We don't know. We also don't know when this is going to happen. But we do know that we cannot afford to be ill-prepared scientifically, socially, and politically for an event that could turn into reality as early as tomorrow." Close quote. And from my professional journal journalism point of view, since September 1979, 43 years ago, on my list of ET interactions with Earth are animal mutilations, human abductions, military encounters with aerial vehicles called UFOs, and today now UAPs, that can travel 12,000 miles an hour and stop mid-air or turn 90-degree angles, these are evidences of some other kind of technology and intelligences beyond humans interacting with Earth, our moon, the solar system, and far beyond. Military pilots encountering Foo Fighters in World War II eight full decades ago. They were encountering very advanced aerial technologies. And today, 80-some years later, I have dozens of files of eyewitness reports from retired military and civilian pilots who know that the round or triangular or spherical or disc or cylindrical or wedge-shaped aerial craft that they have encountered are not human-made. In this Earth Files YouTube channel, I have tried to share with you firsthand testimonies of such military and civil civilian pilots who are still afraid to speak publicly because of threats to their lives serving their country if they talk about their UFO UAP encounters. Pilots with firsthand experiences in UFO encounters usually request John Smith anonymity. But each tells me in their own way that people deserve to know the truth, that UFOs are not 
ours. They are coming from outer space, and some of them even act hostile. All humans deserve to know what our governments know and keep secret. And last week, I shared with you a recorded interview with another John Smith, who was a quartermaster in the U.S. Navy, stationed in the summer of 1986 in the Indian Ocean on the USS Samuel Gompers destroyer tender. It was night near 2.30 a.m., when an estimated 15 glowing red, green, yellow, blue, and orange UFOs appeared above the ship. John Smith described how the commander was awakened and an order was given to lock radar on the erratically moving lights and to ready weapons. The quartermaster said that for 15 minutes, while the UFOs moved erratically in the night sky before they all disappeared at the same moment, the Navy radar operators tried to lock on to the UFOs, but they could not. And the ship's weapon systems were blocked as well. How was that possible? This past weekend, I put the question to David Rossi, host of the Generation Z podcast and recent founder in Toronto, Canada, of what he calls SALT, all caps, S-A-A-L-T, a limited liability company. His acronym stands for Strategic Analysis and Assessment of Longitudinal Technologies. Those are big words for his current passion, trying to understand UFOs, their astounding speeds, complete stops in midair, popping in and out of visibility, using anti-gravity, and they could be manipulating the underlying fabric of our universe, which some earlier UFO researchers, such as Tom Bearden, called the ether. David Rossi is only 24 years old now. After he graduated from Emily Carr Secondary School northwest of Toronto in 2016, he went to work in construction. When COVID hit in 2020, he had a lot of off work time and he began to experiment with copper wire generators and magnets. And then this past summer of 2022, Dave remembers a highly strange experience of either dreaming or experiencing a very tall, teal blue colored non-human who applied a blue beam to the right side of Dave's head. After that, when he saw equations, parts would glow blue on the page and his mind received downloads of information that he associates coming from the teal blue being. His Gen Z podcast has also had several UFO knowledgeable people from military, aerospace, and science backgrounds reach out to him with more UFO information. And now his goal with SALT is to crack open anti-gravity and multi-dimensional scalars. So I decided to ask him about John Smith's experience in the Indian Ocean and the question, how do UFOs block radar and weapon systems? David says he thinks the answer is subatomic manipulation by the very advanced intelligences in UFO UAPs. Let's say you are on that ship and you are a Navy patrol officer trying to lock on to the craft. The radar is telling you that it's detecting something, then it's not, but you could clearly see with your eyes or binoculars, there's a fleet of something there, right? So imagine, for example, with your radar, trying to lock on sort of the same way you would point a flashlight or a laser beam at the craft. And there are multiple different ways that the craft can avoid radar detection or locking in or on. One of the key ways is the manipulation of heat, light, and what we call mass. So basically what would happen is, imagine shining a flashlight at somebody, but when you shine it at the person, that person, for example, is, let's just say hypothetically, is wearing a suit where they're expecting your particular flashlight to shine on them at some point. They pre-planned for this. Whenever that particular light density is shone on them, their suit 
will immediately push and shift not just the heat spectrum, but the light spectrum out of their way so that the radar is pointed in that direction. And in this example, the flashlight would be the radar. You see the craft with your own eyes or with binoculars, but the radar cannot lock on because of the subatomic perturbation in heat, light, delta T variable, known for those that are more into science, and mass. Think about rolling a bowling ball on a bed, and every time you move that bowling ball, there is a little bit of depth at the bottom of the ball because it's pushing down, put a little bit of weight into the bed. Think about the bed as the sky. And whenever a light is shone on the bowling ball, and the bowling ball would be the craft, the bowling ball immediately shifts or does a little twist where at the subatomic level changes the flashlight shining to a different energy density. So to recap, this flashlight represents the radar. The bowling ball represents the craft. The bed represents the space-time, the reality we're living in. And it's essentially at the subatomic level, sort of like how you tune a preamp when you're playing guitar or something like this, or in your car, turning up or down the volume on the knob. You're adjusting the density of the heat and light to avoid the radar. So the craft itself is still exactly where it was and where the men are seeing it on the USS Gompers. They're seeing these 15 UFOs in the sky in different colors. But what you're saying is that the ETs inside of those craft have the technology to be able to change the heat, affect the frequency of the light, so that the craft disappear to radar. Precisely. Radar is meant to detect the current environment of the light and heat spectrum. If you begin to shift in and out of that very quickly or completely to a a part of the spectrum that even the radar can't pick up on, with binoculars, with the naked eye, you'll see the craft there, but the radar is going to have a whole other detection going on. And perhaps, maybe even the naked eye will see some type of phenomenon. Would Russia, China, North Korea any other country be able to block, keep our radar from locking on to their planes or their missiles? Yes, but this is where I'll tell you my experience with what I've been doing at SALT. When people approach me, whether private or government or otherwise, there is a threshold or a barrier that I have that others, contractors have as well, where you can tell, okay, this is ours and ours, I mean human species, or not. There's a big difference. So in other words, Linda, yes, China, Russia, they can, but not in the way that these guys can. (laughs) Okay. And therefore, what you are saying, bottom line is that the UFO, UAP phenomena, in its ability to reject our efforts to follow them on radar, that we cannot get a lock on that our weapon systems will not work against them, that those right there are ingredients that say what's in those lights, what's in those craft, cannot be homo sapiens sapien in human technology. Yes, yes, that's where the data leads, yep. For a whole lot of scientists and military people in JSOC and aerospace and science who know this, The UFO, UAP phenomena, when they block our radar, when we can't lock on, when we have our missiles blocked, it is being blocked in a way that we humans do not have. So why couldn't the description of actual UFO, UAP ability to block radar keep weapon systems from locking onto them? This is intelligence from someplace else, not Earth. Why can't that be a proof? I'm going to be brutally honest with you with some of the things that I've seen on a sensitive setting and some clients that I'm taking up at this moment. They've said to me, Dave, the problem is that if that was our worst issue, we would be able to announce it. The problem is that what happens when you find very terrible mutilations and missing people month after month? How do you explain that? So I've been told 
went doing some consulting for one government, a small government on the other side of the world, they said to me, how can we explain this in a way where if we talk about the things that are not so gruesome, how can we present it to the public of our country in a way that they won't follow up with a question where it's like, okay, if you knew this, what are they doing with the cattle? And why can't human governments and leaders just do a logical step, say, we want you to know, world, that we now understand that there are a variety of other intelligences in the Milky Way galaxy and beyond. And in our case on Earth, the non-humans that interact with our planet have needs for certain chemistries from Earth for their survival. And that is where the bloodless, trackless animal mutilations come in. They are a harvest of chemistries and genetic material for the use of some of the other intelligences on our planet and interacting with our planet. We can do some kind of a trade deal where all of the farmers and the ranchers can get some kind of monetary exchange for being able to provide X percent of animals, exactly as we distribute to supermarkets, we would include the ETs as part of the marketing system on the earth. And if we can do that and start a dialogue about this, then the rest of these issues about energy and technology, we might be able to continue to teach the planet about what other intelligences need and do, and that there is a bell-shaped curve from friendly to neutral to hostile, and that we can't run into the shadows because there is hostility. We have to learn as much about hostile as we do about benevolent and friendly. And then we are basically put into a new relationship with the universe that's very similar to human relationship with each other on Earth. Friendly, neutral, hostile. I fully agree, and I will say that it is of my humble perspective and experience based on not just the show, but with the consulting. And Up until recently, there has been on some type of energy form that has been on this planet, whether inside the planet or on the surface or both, for quite some time, for hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of years, now be the time, in my opinion, this is why I'm trying to do what I do with SALT and trying to go public as much as this will allow me to do so, in the sense that I think this is a great opportunity to teach everyone, to your point, Linda, about the bell-shaped curve, about how, yes, very terrible things, but also very beautiful things have happened with respect to the phenomena in various forms and ways, but We need to take this as a chance to open up to the masses and to learn. And the first time that I realized that we were probably dealing with a sustenance and genetic harvest issue around the bloodless, trackless animal mutilations, meaning that there are non-humans in this end of the Milky Way galaxy that have had a relationship with Earth over millennia. It's how do you get to the step where humans want to be treated fairly and be paid for their animals instead of having them mysteriously taken. And that if we could introduce humanity to other intelligences who have needs like we do. A lot of people say, well, my gosh, you know, this would mean the collapse of everything that we know. Not in my humble perspective, not necessarily. Why would there be a collapse if we end up making a deal with extraterrestrial biological entities for the same animals that we raise to slaughter and eat on Earth? Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So going forward with your SALT effort, what do you see unfolding between now, the beginning of November, and April of 2023, which I have been told April is on a planning of JSOC for opening up the discovery through the Webb telescope, at least of a biological chemistry discovery on a planet, perhaps in the Trappist solar system, deliberately to open up 
we are not the only life form and that the web is going to confirm biological signature on a planet in another solar system in April 2023. Unfortunately, Linda, I'm trying my best in the moment to try and phrase this in a particular way for you and your audience. But unfortunately, I would ask your audience very kindly to read between the lines here when I say that I can't comment on that for contractual obligations. So I'm close. Uh, Make of that as you will, respectfully. (laughs) Is it not fair to say that since World War II, reality has been classified? Absolutely. I can say this because it's in the public academic literature. If one reads and takes a look at the science, it's been there. Yes, it's there. And it has been, I would actually say before World War II, I would go mid-1800s. Is it possible that in the spring of 2023, maybe engineered to get here by ETs, that some different type of energy is going to be focused on this planet deliberately to get rid of negative energy that had this planet by the throat? I will say that, uh, watching my words carefully here, that if there were to be in April or around that time some type of electromagnetic or energy pulsation is on track to occur. That some positive energy could interact with Earth in April 2023 and have an impact in this dimension. Yes. Again, watching my words carefully, there could be or could not be efforts to potentially enact something in which you just described. And do you know if our government has done a look into the future with the help of the tall whites and the Nordics, meaning looking into time to see if, in fact, that the result is positive, linked directly to the spring of 2023? With respect to linking to the spring of 2023, I cannot comment on that with respect to a device looking into various points in what we call time. Yes, that's been real for a long time now. Have we seen a positive future beyond 2030? Yes, in some outcomes, yes. It's mixed? Yes. And that's why getting humans to Mars is important? I will say... There are multiple plans at hand. Nothing is set in stone. I would love to hear from all of you about what you think in terms of doing sort of a thought exercise with David on if animal mutilations are part of some kind of need, biochemistry or other, by non-humans, coming back and forth on this planet, then would it make sense that we could be told everything publicly and then there could be some kind of an arrangement where we did have some kind of an agreement? And Ian, there's a lot of noise coming from your speaker, if you can hear me there. And I would like to know if a lot of you feel that even though we haven't been introduced yet, it's inevitable because we're not alone in this universe. What do you think about the whole idea of coming into some sort of an agreement term with something non-human about animal mutilations? And that is, and the reason I'm bringing it up is in the context of where I started at the beginning, that there is now Uh, this issue at St. Andrews where they're going to try to come up with some formalized communication that if we get ET either in the sky or however it would happen, that there would then be already a prepared response from Earth humans. It's in that context that I raise that question. And realizing that I have been told multiple times in my career since doing a strange harvest at the CBS station in Denver that the big problems that the government has always seen is how do you bring up that there is other life in the universe, but they are 
mutilating animals and abducting humans, that that is always been considered something that had to be unstated. But tonight, I am trying to put it in the context of what could be dialogue, what could be agreement, what could be trade treaties, especially if we truly have help from the tall whites and the Nordics and perhaps these teal blues that also Adam Burns in New York City, the graphic illustrator that I have had on the Earth Files channel several times in the past several months, he also had interaction with these teal blues, which have definitely not been talked about very much on the planet since World War II, but he also had the impression that they wanted to help and support humans. Well, in this context of the friendly, the neutral, the hostile, which are supportive of humans, who is trying to help, who are neutral, and then others that are not uh, peaceful or friendly, I thought that I would share with you an email that I received almost a year ago in December of 2021. And this is one of those that I have kept in a particular place where I put things that I think I would like to share with you, the Earth Files YouTube channel, but I'm not sure if it's the right time because this is a complex, difficult evolution that we are in as humans with each other on Earth, let alone trying to now get to a point where there is an a uh, uh, I guess we'll say a handshake between one or more other intelligences and that we truly move into the space age. Tonight seemed the appropriate time to pick this up from where it's been for almost a year. This is from a man who lives in Australia. He sent this email in December of 2021. He says that he has been face to face with a tall white who telepathically answered some of his questions as he posed them verbally. He got a rush of telepathy and answers from the tall white. And as I recall in an interview that I had done with him on the phone, he was only a few feet. The tall white was standing and he was standing. Australian. Are there alien entities trying to establish authoritarian control over humans? Tall white. Yes, that is true. The reptilians. Australian. Is it true that there are three alien groups fighting for control here on Earth? Tall white. Yes. Australian. Reptilians are the bad guys? Answer. Yes. And the greys and their associates are neutral or play both sides? Answer. Yes. Australian, why don't you intervene directly to save us and help us? Tall White, because of free will, you must learn your lessons. We will intervene within limits, but no nuclear war. And we must allow mistakes to be made for the learning process to take place. Only through suffering do you learn, and you must learn. If we intervene for all bad things, then you would learn nothing. You need to reform yourselves through a leap of consciousness into an era of reconversion. Australian. Well, why are we having these calamities? Tall White. Some are natural, and some are brought on by bad aliens and their proxies to create deliberate chaos and bring about a need for authoritarian order. If we did everything for you, you would have authoritarian rule, no free will and no responsibility. If we intervene constantly, you would not have freedom. 
you would live under authoritarian rule and would not be allowed to make mistakes. Australian. When will you all arrive and announce yourselves officially? Tall White. We have arrived. We have been here, but not everybody can see us or communicate with us. We will increasingly make our presence known in the coming few years to push the sense of urgency. This has to do with free will, self-determination, establishing your own destiny, individualism against authoritarianism. That is the dichotomy. Australian. Is there anything else you can tell me? The tall white. Yes, the big question about intervention. Think about this. If somebody constantly saves you from yourself, are you really saved or is the inevitable merely delayed? You know about recovery from addiction. Addicts must hit bottom, want to change, and then pull themselves up on their own. That is when the lesson sinks in. A bird in the nest does not know how to fly until it attempts to fly on its own. Living and making decisions on your own with guidance, but under your own power. Think of the children of the wealthy who often struggle to make it on their own. These children have everything. They never face hardships, fight their own battles, or face much danger. True freedom comes from having responsibility and facing danger and hardship on your own terms and then succeeding. The reptilians and their proxies want to convince you that you humans are too weak and need help all the time and cannot make it on your own. You slowly give them authority over you in exchange for safety. That is one path, but not the preferred path. This is what it will come down to, authority versus freedom. I've talked with the man who sent this to me in the email a couple of hours. He has had profound experiences with a tall white in Australia. But exactly as this Q&A, and I've heard it from other people who have had experiences with the tall whites, that you can have some kind of limited exchange. It will be telepathic and quite clear, but they won't stay around to go on and on and on for discussions. And that they come in and out of the few people's lives in which they, for this particular instance, it was a face-to-face which I think is what we all sort of fantasize about, that eventually we will be introduced to non-humans and then somehow they will become part of our lives, whether or not it is ever in earth cities, but that they would become part of an interaction. And in this case, I understand that the Australian, from his dialogue and his own dreams, is extremely concerned about what is coming next on the earth in terms of possible physical trauma. And so I'm sharing this with you, not with the idea of being afraid or defeated, but taking to heart and to soul the words whether it was from a tall white or from a human or from somebody else. I think these are really, really strong and important words to think about and live by if we can. And so I want to turn it back over to you all for your comments and your questions and bring Ian in now on the speaker. Thank you, Ian. Hi, Linda. Thank you very much. Okay, Linda, we've got some questions, and here's one already from Magnetized Light. Why don't animals feed on the dead, mutilated cows? Is it because there is no blood, 
or some kind of strange energy being given off by the mutilated cows or something we don't understand. In uh, the first part of the video that I did with David Rossi, I talked about, and it probably isn't very clear because I'm trying to be uh, sort of reserved in how I'm saying it, but I used the word a harvest. The mutilations are a harvest of chemistries. I don't have break, broken down information about which chemistries that can range from proteins to other fluids. But what I have been given is a concept that I think makes sense. If the Defense Intelligence Agency agent analyst in 1999 was correct and that there have been three extraterrestrial civilizations fighting each other over Earth, which the tall white basically reinforces and references. And if the various primates, going back to Homo erectus up to Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien, are the product of genetic manipulation of already evolving primates on Earth, dot, 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 by competing extraterrestrial civilizations. It could be that the complexities of what Homo sapiens sapien are are related to the fact that three different extraterrestrial groups have competed with each other over genetic manipulation of the planet. But that Whatever, if 270 million years is at least accurate for some of the ETs on Earth based here and having projects, then it may be that a specific type or types of non-humans are dependent upon certain chemistries from Earth life to sustain their life. I think we've all heard about how the greys are fighting for survival, that they are a race at the end of too much uh, AI and genetic manipulation. And it may be that it is in that kind of context that the mutilations are gathering, they are a harvest of the fluids, of the blood, of some of the tissues, the ear, the eye, the tongue, the jaw flesh, the genitals, the rectal uh, tissue, and then when there's money for necropsies and you open up animals, which I have done to some degree with Dr. John Outshuler back in the 90s before uh, he was uh, in an accident and then passed away. Uh, a tremendous loss because he was brilliant and we were doing good work looking at exactly these kinds of questions. And that the idea would be that inside might be organ removal, and we found that, with no surgery on the outside of the bodies. And when you actually do necropsies, you find whole hearts can be missing inside of these animals, and there's not one drop of fluid. Can you imagine how you would enter into a 1,700-pound uh, cow or steer, bulls are heavier, and you would extract the heart, leaving the pericardium that surrounded it, and the jugular veins and aortas, there would be no fluid, there's no blood in the body, everything is absolutely dry, but the heart is completely removed and as I have talked with some medical people, they say that is what they hope, that eventually we will have what is called molecular extraction surgery. It means frequencies will be the key, and a heart will have a certain frequency, a gallbladder will have a certain frequency, bones will have a certain frequency, cartilage, skin, and that surgery in some point off in the far future you won't have big excisions through your muscles and cartilage and so forth. 
it will be done through some kind of a beam that is a frequency that will only interact with the tissue that you want. And it will not be cutting with a scalpel. It will be looking at the body internally with some kind of, of scanning ability and then the aiming and then the, fr the frequency of, let's say, uh, the gallbladder. The beam goes into the gallbladder, does either total extraction or part if there's a tumor. And everything, the skin, the cartilage, the bone are totally untouched. Well, that is one of the future contemplations of my interview with one of the doctors in Denver about what they are hoping surgery would go to. And the reason why he, we had this discussion is the discovery that inside of mutilated animals, meaning the ear, eye, tongue, jaw, genitals, and rectal surface tissue removed, necropsies confirmed the removal of a variety of different organs in different animals with no excision, and that that's what molecular extraction would be a highly advanced technology that we do not have publicly anyway on Earth. So chemistries, if they're able to extract by frequencies certain organs, then I'm assuming that they can extract from whatever is in the animal exactly the molecular and atomic structures that they may need for some kind of survival because of a long time interaction with this planet. That is said in speculation as I have had these discussions with medical people in speculation. But I think that it continues to add up more and more that this, the idea of a harvest, and that's why back in 1979, I had been working with uh, veterinarians and others. It was very clear to me in the nine months that I worked on that documentary, this was a harvest, and that's why I called it a strange harvest. And by the time that it was broadcast in May uh, 25th, 1980, even though I would not meet and be able to work with Dr. John Altshuler, a hematologist and pathologist, until the end of the 80s. It was clear uh, for um, all kinds of evidentiary reasons that they were specific harvests, uh, extremely specific, and that the excisions that I would learn with Dr. John Altshuler, I already had. Uh, other, where there would be a lab report or a veterinarian report from cases uh, before I even did a strange harvest that would talk about that the edges of excisions had been exposed to high heat. And in the 1960s, nobody was working with lasers. In the early 1970s, no one in veterinary medicine was working with lasers. And so the, the evidence came long before people started seriously contemplating that we would end up eventually with molecular extraction surgery that still isn't here yet. It may be being experimented with, but it's not global. And that has always emphasized for me the context of looking at animal mutilations as something that has needs, but which ones and why specifically? If it's the reptilians, as many people in the abduction syndrome say, that it is the reptilians who harvest from the animals, uh, why would that be necessary if the reptilians have been here the longest of all of the non-human civilizations? And you would think that they wouldn't have to harvest from surface animals. And I leave you on that with the complexity of what I call the 16-layer chess game, 
where you can't tell the players without technologies. It's all so complex. But I think that we are at least talking about large, true issues. Okay, Ian, I know I took longer than normal, but it seemed like a very important question to answer in depth. Absolutely, thank you, Linda. We've, you asked people for their comments as well. Melanie Kay says, I do not consent to this harvest. Bella says, should never be tolerated, no agreement. Mm. Judy Graham says, all living beings should try to first to understand needs of other species. The goal would then be to raise synthetic food sources. Uh, Tracy Murray says, no, I don't agree with the human abductions in any way, shape or form. Some people are left so traumatized they end up with PTSD. Oh, the, the uh, issue, <coughs> but wait, Ian, the issue that I was raising was specifically only about mutilations. The human abduction syndrome is a whole other huge complex piece in which there are harvests there. But my question earlier was focused only on the idea that if animals on Earth provided chemistries that were needed to extraterrestrial biological entities because they had had a long evolutionary history with this planet and had become dependent upon certain chemistries from this Earth, that was my question. What would people say? Would, would people agree to doing some kind of a or organized trade in which ranchers and farmers would be compensated? That, that is the question that I put on the table. Human abductions, I, uh, that's a whole other complex, very difficult subject. They're all difficult subjects, <laughs> but we can't not discuss them. It's my feeling. That's why I'm doing the Earth Files YouTube channel. So I hope that clear, clears up. I'm not, was not talking about abductions. Linda, thank you for the clarification. Mike Basil says, a mutilated pregnant cow though, that's so cruel. Yes, and, and I know, and if you had been in my shoes, when I think back to September of 1979, and then for the next 10 years, I was in pastures all over the United States and Canada and England and Australia and various places dealing with all of this. And there were times when I felt vulnerable to it, when I felt anger, when I felt tremendous sadness, all of these ranges of contradictory emotions. But today, I have a lot deeper understanding, I think, of some of the true history of this planet that we have still never been told. And that has to do with civilizations that have been on the earth before humans. And then continue to manipulate the Homo sapiens sapien. So I feel that every direction that you go, anything that you bring up, you're confronting that without us as a species, having anything explained to us about why various pieces of evolutionary history have happened. It's why I say we're an abused species. We were brought into being and experimented on in many ways, but we have never been told the truth about our relationship with other life in this universe. And that's the gap. And I understand why people would respond with uh, an emotion, no. But I am really trying to understand in the, in the bigger, longer picture that I have been in this, that there could be, if we understood the whole story and the real truths, there could be an act of compassion that humans 
might come to if they understood that there was an extraterrestrial civilization that needed chemistries from Earth to ultimately survive. And we might be able to help them and they might be able to help us. That's the, the intersection that I'm trying to bring into focus tonight. Okay, Ian. Thank you, Linda. I need to do the super chats for this evening, so oh, here okay. we go. Moonbird, Christina Ledesma Jimenez, Obi Wan, Terry D, Yin Yang Glow, W Decker, Linda Emeterio, Luis Cangera, Jeannie Nash, and Alan's here from New Realities as well. Oh, Alan Steinfeld? Yeah, he's in the chat as well. Wow, Alan, I sent you uh, an email uh, a month or so ago and say, what country are you in? <laughs> I didn't even know what country he was in. Thank you, Alan. Good to see you. Do check, do check in with us, Alan, and let us know yeah. where you are. Yeah, which uh, country? <laughs> Linda, Linda Emeterio says she would like to see you at a conference sometime. Linda, we've got a conference coming up in April next year. Could you just tell us about that as well? Uh, this is uh, the, um, what is the whole title in April? The whole title of that April uh, that we're all going to about think so. yeah um this is the ascension conference isn't that's it? right ascension but what is the ascension to a portal it's the ascension conference it's a portal to ascension conference portal to in ascension. san diego yeah sorry um it, I, there's so many things to carry around in the mind and uh the ascension portal to ascension and there's going to be a lot of people, and that's in April. And Alan and I and others who cross paths at conferences will be a lot of us there. And I hope that uh, what we'll start doing is putting up promotions at Earth Files also again as we get a little closer uh, into January, February. And they, uh, that it would be fun if a lot of people who are here, that we end up in the matter world all together, especially, especially if what I have been told over a year ago, that first it was that the spring of 2023 was on some planning. And then later on, about five or six months ago, I received a communication that it was uh, really firming up that April of 2023 was going to be used with the Webb telescope to make the announcement that they have found biological signature on a planet, perhaps the fourth planet in the TRAPPIST-1 solar system, and that this is how they would break it to the world. It would be safe, far enough away, nothing coming in the skies, they will show the chemistry. That, that those are the wavy line images that the web puts out with different chemistries and physics. And in this case, it would be a biological signature. And that this would be groundbreaking, centuries breaking news that the web was confirming a biological signature, meaning that what all the ingredients were could only be related to a biological life form. And so it would be safe and at a distance, headlines 10, inch, 10 inches high. Uh, we finally found life in the universe and that this would be the beginning, the beginning of a brand new era as we move out into space and we finally start breaking through a lot of truths. Some might relate to negatives and some might relate to positives and some might relate to neutrals, but that we would finally begin to get this. Well, April 23rd is the same time as the Portal to Ascension conference, I think, Ian. So we might all be at that conference and this gets announced. 
Yes, I hope to be there myself. And uh, I've put the notes in the chat, and I, I think the notes now are in the uh, in the notes below the sh below the show tonight. Good, 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 good. Linda, sexy Sadie says, is the same tall white group as Charles Hall and Nellis Air Force Base. Australia has a lot of desert, so it makes sense. It could be the same. And Kevin Isaacson says. Has the Australian tall white story mentioned anything of the base in the United States at all? Are they related or separate colonies? The Australian and I did not talk about that specifically, but I too have wondered if the areas that I know that we have had some arrangement for, like Alice Springs, there's supposed to be a huge underground base that the tall whites completely control under Alice Springs a lot of us have heard about that. I think Charles Hall, without question, in his videos talked about that. And the fact that uh, the man that in Australia is in an area where it is warm, it may be a temperature thing. It might be a where they want it drier. Nobody has explained. Uh, I don't know any abductee who has had a discussion with the tall whites about where are you based underground, under the seas of this planet and why. I, I don't know details, but it is possible that it may be uh, deserty, less wet areas that the tall whites prefer. But I do not know that for a fact. And it is something that I can see if I can uh, get a, a response to the question from the uh, Australian and see if he does have any comments on that. But, but you know what the bigger box of that question is, the DIA analyst in December of 1999 told me three competing civilizations, they've been based on and inside of the earth in deep, huge caverns, underneath the basins of the oceans, the seas and the lakes, the greys like to be inside of mountains. And you begin to understand that if it's 270 million years ago, that three of these civilizations were already on Earth, harvesting, using, uh, terraforming, whatever they were doing. And we are only 45,000 years old, give or take, around the transition with Neanderthal. The, those that have been using Earth as a laboratory for 270 million years and are still involved in the planet, what, <laughs> what could they tell us if they told us the truth? I'd like to be there for that. <laughs> so maybe they're underground for a reason and maybe someday they will interact with us possibly, in some public way. All right, Ian. I've got a question from Dolores Green, who says, could a spouse's fears keep their spouse from communication? Could their what fears? Could a spouse's fears... Oh, it's about like a husband. You mean a husband. You mean a husband. Uh, obviously, it talks about the communication with ETs and uh, abductions. Scenario, yeah, but, I imagine. Uh, Ian, are you mean? Is the word S P O U S E a spouse? Meaning right. Not, yes. Mean, okay. Could a spouse's fears of non-humans keep non-humans away? Did, could the the spouse's fears keep their spouse from communication with ETs? I really don't know. I I do not know. I don't think we know enough. Uh, it, there are d different types interacting with humans with different goals, and it seems to me it's so complex uh, that I don't know if any human would have an answer to that particular question. Um, no. I've, I've got time. I'll take one more. Okay. Here we are. Richard Urquhart says... Can you ask Linda if our dreams can connect us to other people's consciousness? Well, I'd turn it around this way. 
I know that I've had dreams that upon waking in the dream, these are the vivid dreams that I ask people in the abductions about, but all my life I have had, uh, not all, all the time, but they're vivid dreams and I wake up inside of the vivid dream. And depending upon what I am seeing, it comes true. And so I have always related to the vivid dreams that I have had as communication that is coming to me, whether it is the thought that dwells in the light, it is some other super consciousness that interacts not just with me, I think with humans in general, and that some of us are especially sensitive and or uh, what Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff wrote uh, in 2014 about discovering in a microscope that there were these tubules, little tiny, tiny tubules all over parts of the human brain. And both Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff hypothesized that they had found a biological structure, meaning these tubules, that they hypothesized would explain a vibratory frequency relationship between a conscious universe, that the whole universe is conscious, and that that, that is how we can receive information sort of from the infinite consciousness. And it may be that some people have more of those microtubules or there is a genetic evolutionary line, all of the things that we don't understand very well. But that I have always felt because of the experience that they're, they're never like dreams and they're not nightmares at all, but they are often information delivering. And I've always been amazed at how accurate these are. I've asked for information for titles in documentaries and things that I've been working on, and I will wake up and have information as if there is a dialogue between an individual human consciousness and something that listens and returns information. And so I think then the next step I would say is, are the varieties of ETs that could be millions, but do they interact consciously with the universe as well? Do they have cycles of dreams? Do all beings sleep and dream? And in the dreams, did the dreams come about originally so that the universe could have conscious, or we might say subconscious dialogue with life forms in this particular universe? On that note, I'll say thank you for being here tonight. Let's keep our subscriptions going so we can have our champagne party at 275000 And that I hope to hear from you all about whether you felt this sort of deeper, more serious dive tonight through the help of David Rossi and those of you with your excellent questions. Was this helpful tonight? And I ask it because it seems to me that we are in such a strange place in the Earth timeline about humans being even able to relate to each other, let alone other beings from other places. Next week, we'll be back. It'll be a new story. And I look forward to hearing from you during the week. I love you guys. Take care.
Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white Settings button next to the CC button. Select Subtitle CC and then select Auto Translate. Select a language and the captions will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads. I never had a cat do that before. And they'll pull against the comb, helping me get out snarls. And I think it's the best they've ever been.